This is the box for the Bible I'll be reviewing today. It's the uh, New American Standard Bible, the 1995 updated edition of the Side Column Reference Bible in black calfskin leather. Here is the ISBN. And the side of the box mentions some of the features that we'll show shortly. Um, it has wide margins, lots of cross-references, large type. Uh, it is Smythe sewn, uh, two ribbon markers, imported French paper to limit bleed through. And inside the box is the Bible itself. It comes in this cloth sleeve with a flap to prevent damage to the pages. So here's the calfskin book itself. Black calfskin. It is edge lined. The uh, liner is some kind of synthetic material. Feels a bit spongy. Let's see if we can show you a corner. Let's see the way that's done. And down in here. has uh, two black ribbon markers, which I tend to keep tucked away. So you see that one's tucked away there. It is long, fairly long, and it has a nice clean cut to the end, three-eighths of an inch wide. It has black and yellow headbands. The dimensions of the book are um, nine and three-quarters inches tall, seven inches wide, and it's two inches thick. Let me give you a good view of the spine. One, two, three, four, five, Ray's Hubs, Foundation Publications, Side Column Reference Bible, and Calfskin. Take a quick tour of the book itself, and then we'll go in and talk about the pages in some detail. Um, Sheet thickness is 39 micrometers, so my estimate is that the paper weight is 36 GSM. And we will attempt to show you here the bleed through while we're here. So you're seeing through to the next sheet there. You should be able to read New American Standard Bible. So it's fairly opaque. Let's, let's show it to you without a page in the intervening. You have the title page here. Reference edition, Foundation Publications, Anaheim, California. Then on the opposite side of the page, Copyright 1995 Lockman Foundation. All the normal stuff about quotations. And then at the bottom of the page, Printed in the United States of America. Opposite page is uh, forward with a preface to the New American Standard Bible, principles of translation. Um, talk about things like the tenses, Hebrew tenses here. This is quite interesting down here. They explain their philosophy in translating Greek tenses. Symbols in the text, uh, it has notes and cross references. Paragraphs begin with uh, bold face, uh, bold type. Uh, quotation marks are used just as in normal English. They have in this edition, they've dropped the thy, these, and thous, which they retained in the 1977 edition, just like the Revised Standard Version retained them. Italics for supplied words, small caps to quote the Old Testament and the New, and then the star indicates where they have changed the Greek tense, the Greek present tense, to an English past tense. Books of the Bible. We, uh, 
we have a New Testament that is, well, we have an Old Testament that is 1,344 pages long, a New Testament that is 405 pages long. Last book begins on page 380. Um, and then at the end there'll be a concordance that's 82 pages long and 10 pages of maps. I'm not going to spend any time right now talking about the page layout. I'll just flip forward, show you the end of the Old Testament, beginning of the New Testament. So the Old Testament ends with the end of Malachi, page 1344. You have a new sheet of paper here, beginning the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John all start on their own pages, as does Acts and Romans. And then very curiously, at the end of Romans, I know this is important to some people, at the end of the of Romans, 1 Corinthians begins, but it does not begin on its own a separate sheet of paper. The same kind of thing happens in the Old Testament here. The uh, New Testament ends here at the end of Revelation on page 405. Then we have a concordance in three columns. It runs for 82 pages as I said. And at the end of that, 10 black and white maps, which is very interesting to me. And they're on the same kind of paper as the Bible itself is printed on. The end sheets, and then the uh, edge lined back of the Bible. There's no uh, stitching here. So there's the book in overview. Um, one thing I would want to point out is it really uh, doesn't want to lie down flat. You can twist it down like this, but this page really does want to bend up higher on the other side. So in this portion we'll take a look at the page layout. The uh, pages have the book titles and the outside of the page, as well as the page numbers in the outside. The references are on the outside, separated from the text by a, a vertical line. Um, page dimensions are 234 millimeters tall, 166 millimeters wide. That's nine and three six inches tall, six and nine sixteenths inches wide. From the left edge of the text to the line is about ninety five millimeters. Margins at the top of the page, fifteen and a half. At the bottom, as you can see, it's more narrow. It's only about thirteen. The inner margin is about fourteen millimeters, but that varies with where you are in the book. The outer I'll give you two measurements here from the line to the outer edge of the paper is 55 millimeters, that's 2.17 inches. From the right hand edge of the references, right about here to the edge of the paper, is 28 millimeters or 1.1 inches. One inches. The, uh, the font is advertised at 11, and I think you'll be able to see that in fact compares very nicely to an 11 point font. I'll get the two thens next to each other. That works pretty well in Times New Roman. In uh, Georgia, the Georgia equivalent is about a uh, 10 point font. In the verse references over here, this font is only about 7 points. Uh, characters per line is reasonable. There are about 62 characters per line. Line spacing is somewhat cramped, however. 
and I'll show you that in a few space places here. Uh, for instance, if you look here at uh, deep in Genesis 1, the descender on the P, and the descenders in Bible fonts are usually very short, as are the ascenders, the deep and the T and the they almost touch each other, which means that there's really not much spacing in the lines. You can see that in another couple of places here. If we go down to uh, verse 16 here, the G in light and the H in night almost touch each other. And then a little farther down the page, 19 and 20, um, you have uh, a G in evening and the L and let here are almost touching each other, which means there's very little space between the lines. The uh, headings that they insert into the book are in an oblique type, and they're smaller than the Bible text, which is a good thing but sometimes they just don't give very much space around them. So here is an example. This is the heading between Genesis 5 and Genesis 6. You see how little room there is there between the two books of the Bible? And the heading is just kind of squeezed in there between those two books. I think it needs a little more space there. Um, paper is not especially glossy. There's not a lot of sheen to it. There's some, but it's not very bad. It is opaque, as we showed earlier. And uh, I think we'll move on to the next section. I believe what I'd like to do next is to do some comparisons. Okay, now I've got the, the book uh, set up at uh, the end of chapter 1 in Genesis, and I just want to show this uh, American printing at the same time as a Chinese printing of the same page. This is um, another single column reference, the American Standard, and we'll try to line up the pages next to each other. And what you should be able to see here is for instance, if you look here at uh, God in verse 27, you can see that although the print here looks a bit darker, you have to deal with quite a lot more show through from the other page than you do here on the American printing. American printing, although it's a little bit lighter in terms of the darkness of the ink, is a much cleaner print because there's very little to no show through. I think you can see that here as well if you look at the references and see what's not showing through from the other page here versus here. Okay, I have another similar Bible. This is a Hol Holman uh, single column NASB side reference, which I bought back in the 1980s, 80 time frame. So let's see if we can line those up. 27 with 27 more or less. 26 with 26 here. And you can see that the font has changed between these two. Uh, the pages here are a bit more yellow. And there's a bit more show through here with the old American printing of uh, by Hallman is uh, actually not that bad. I'm going to attempt to show the Allen Long primer font on the right and the uh, NASB on the left are roughly at the same spot in uh, Genesis. So you can see the two fonts are roughly the same size. This is a bit bolder, but still it shows you this is a very nice printing. 
very nice font. I've mentioned in other videos that I'm not a great uh, NASB fan, but I do like a lot of things about it. I like the fact that it's a generally word-for-word -word translation. I think the, uh, the references are excellent. A very thorough, nice reference set. Um, it is not in generally it is not using it does not use gender neutral language and to my tastes that's uh, much preferable to those translations that do I do have a number of issues with it um, literal readings are often given in the footnotes not in the text itself for instance here 42 literally that one I think perhaps that uh, the publishers give themselves credit for the literal readings that are in the margin. When I did my study of 14 translations a few years ago, I found that the New American Standard Bible was not the most literal translation, but I did not give them credit for marginal readings, since those aren't in the translation itself. For instance, if you were to buy one of these new preacher's Bibles, um, the way I understand it, it has only the text itself you would be missing the marginal notes. And then those literal meaning, uh, literal readings that are in the margins would escape you. Um, this particular printing I really like uh, because it's in black letters. You'll see no red letters in this one at all. Um, I want to talk about a few things though that annoy me about the translation. One we go to Ephesians and in close proximity with each other here in verse 10 where it says with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of time then you only go just a few more verses down and you have that awkward expression repeated verse 14 with a view to the redemption of God's own possession. I really wish they would have found some other way to translate that. That with a view to is just, to me, it's just annoying. Um, over here, Second Thessalonians chapter nine, chapter one, verse nine. I flipped forward to Peter. I missed the mark. Here we go. Where it says, um, they will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. I, I heard a sermon by John MacArthur where he went on and on about uh, the fact that that's away from there. Well, the Greek uh, is just a, a pa. Uh, it's the same preposition that's here. Uh, grace to you and peace away from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't think so. Is the penalty away from God's glorious power? I don't think it's away from God's glorious power. I think the eternal destruction is due to, directly due to, His glorious power. So uh, away from, I think, is just an unnecessary translation there. They could have, if they really want to, um, emphasize that possibility that a paw there does mean away from, why not put away in italics? Or include an explanatory note here that says uh, either away from or from the presence of the Lord. From the presence of the Lord strikes me as being the superior translation there. But I can understand how away from is a possibility it just doesn't seem to me to be the best one there. Best choice. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 19. Uh, made alive in the spirit in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. Well, at least they put the word now in italics there. But I think that to insert now here is to take the Greek, which is ambiguous, and make a decision in terms of a preferable interpretation on a passage that's controversial. 
another thing that the New American Standard Bible likes to do is to replace something that's interesting and maybe earthy with something that's um, abstract and academic. Um, here we are in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, where they've chosen to um, translate the Greek with from the presence of the serpent. And then they give you the note. It says literally face. Um, I don't see the presence of the serpent adds anything that face of the serpent doesn't already have. And face of the serpent is a more interesting expression. I will attempt to make a graphic and show it here that gives you several other examples of where they've replaced something interesting with something kind of abstract and dull and bland. I understand that um, <clears throat> Foundation Publications is working on a new version of the New American Standard Bible, which they hope to publish in about 2019. Uh, it's kind of interesting to look at the changes that were introduced in the 95 um, update to the New Testament. Uh, here we are in Mark 8.6. It says, and he directed the people to sit down. Well, people there replaces the 1977, and he directed the multitude to sit down. Why did they replace people with multitude? Do they think that we're too stupid now to understand what multitude means? Wouldn't crowd have been a better replacement than people? I'm just curious. Okay, here we're at Acts chapter 7 verse 38. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness. And then they point out that the Greek word here is ekklesia. Well, that's all well and good. But in the 77, at verse 38, it said, This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness. And then if you follow the footnote, it says, Or church, which is the way ecclesia is translated almost everywhere else in the New Testament. And then they give you the Greek ecclesia. So why that change? Was it because dispensationalist pastors were being asked questions about what this church in the wilderness was and how that Old Testament church was being called a church if uh, Israel and the New Testament are uh, the New Testament church are so distinct? Is that possibly the reason that they deleted or church here? I certainly don't know. Still in the book of Acts now, we're in chapter 7, verse 54, where the 95 New American Standard says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and there is no note on cut to the quick. But in the same verse, in the 77 edition, there is a note. They were cut to the quick, and then if you look to the margin, it says, in their hearts. They were cut in their hearts, literally. So it actually gives you the literal meaning, but uh, the 95 version has seen fit to eliminate the uh, literal meaning from the margin. I have no idea why. I have no conspiracy theory in this case. Now we're at uh, 1 John 2.17. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. In 77, it read more literally, The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Did the translators or the editors think that we no longer understood what the word abide means? Is abide now mysterious? This um, this change is uh, actually very puzzling. This is in Revelation chapter uh, 12, verse 18, or, or chapter 13, verse 1, depending on how it's numbered. Uh, and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. There is no note there to tell you that the word dragon is not in the Greek. In the 77 version, 
77 edition, it correctly says, and he stood on the sand of the seashore, and then the note to the side points out that some manuscripts read, I stood. That tells you much more than the 95 version does. And uh, the text note is, is absolutely accurate. Uh, this is the 27th uh, Nestle Allen Nestle Allen Greek text, uh, and he stood. And then the little symbol here, the gamma-like symbol, points you down below, and it says that some manuscripts, and it gives you some indications. It includes the majority text, has the theta eta new ending, which means I stood, uh, whereas the text that they chose, he stood, is backed up by P47 and the great unseal manuscripts. Why did they not uh, let you know that the word dragon is not in the Greek and that they just made that up? I have no idea. So uh, that's my overview of this uh, 1995 New American Standard side column uh, reference Bible in a calfskin binding printed in the United States of America with French milled paper with very, very little show through. And no, none of those horrendous black letters, uh, <laughs> black letters, red letters. I understand that the red letters were actually introduced in 1899 and uh, I'm going to have to investigate the hypothesis that they were introduced as part of a Jesuit plot to uh, keep me from reading Jesus's words because those little red letters burn so much into my eyes. Um, very nice paper, beautifully printed, um, black and white maps, a nice wonderful feel in your hands and uh, oh gilt but not art gilt edges I think I've said enough well, I just wanted to show the boxes for the two Bibles that made cameo appearances in addition to the Alan Long primer in this video one is this uh, NASB side column reference Bible it's the ISBN it's in genuine leather the ISBN perhaps better there. Black Genuine Leather, style number 863. It's a nice black letter Bible. Inexpensive. Very sturdy. This is the older one, the Holman side column reference Bible in the 1977 New American Standard. Unfortunately it has the words of Christ in red, otherwise I would be tempted to get this Fiora bonded leather, which is starting to lose its red color. Um, rebound. And uh, those are the numbers there. It's something of a rare book now. The 77 is definitely, definitely a better translation than the 95.